Good afternoon, everyone. So I am Ronnie Sebro. So I am one of the uh, deputy editors at Radiology AI. I'm a statistician by training, but in my daytime job, I pretend to be a radiologist, a musculoskeletal radiologist. So I'm a professor of radiology, orthopedic surgery, and biostatistics at Mayo Clinic. And today I'm really, really excited because I'll be talking to you about artificial intelligence, machine learning, but in particular, statistics for diagnostics. And this is a very introductory, it's a very basic lecture to sort of build a groundwork, a framework for which everyone can build on as they go into doing statistics in biomedical research. So I have no financial disclosures. I have been working on that, but uh, so far I've been very unsuccessful. Uh, so I'm an editorial board of a number of journals, so including Radiology AI and Journal of Digital Imaging, editorial consultant for GMS. So today I want to sort of reflect back on uh, some of the fun times I had in San Francisco. So I went to UCSF for medical school and did residency at UCSF. And I remember working at the VA hospital. This is a picture of the VA hospital in San Francisco. And every day you'd walk in, you'd see this little sign that said, all gave some, but some gave all. So I'd like to wish everyone a happy Veterans Day and sort of remember all veterans out there and thank them for their service. So if you detect an accent, it's probably because you weren't born in the Caribbean. <laughs> so uh, I was born in the Caribbean. I grew up in a very small village and this is sort of the village we grew up in. And uh, when you're about eight years old, before you can go out to fish from the boats, you typically have to be certified to swim. And, and the certification process is a very uh, weird process. You have to pretty much uh, swim from one bay over to the other. It's not that far, uh, probably about, I'm guessing, maybe 200 yards. But, you know, it's sort of intimidating because no one comes with you. And uh, what's really funny is that my grandmother told me before I made that swim, the people who drown are the people who can't swim. The people who drown are the people who think they can. And this is a very interesting statement because I never forgot this statement because she was right. If you knew you couldn't swim, you would not go in the water. <laughs> so fast forward many, many years in 1999, this paper came out. This is a paper by Dunning and Kruger. And it's a very famous paper. And what it talks about is they actually looked at some, I think it was some students who performed on a math test. And they thought there'd be a correlation between what a student thought, you know, the, the actual score and how the student thought they did. And what they saw was a, there was no correlation, actually, it was sort of opposite to what they expected. The students who scored the highest thought that the tests were very hard and difficult. And the students who scored somewhat lower thought that the tests were very easy. And so they came up with this effect called the Dunning Kruger effect. And what they thought of is that people who are unskilled and unaware of it sort of have difficulty in recognizing that they're sometimes incompetent. So whenever we start to learn an ex a task, very quickly we go to this peak, they call it the peak of Mount Stupid. And they think we're perfect and we think we're experts, but gradually over time, as we get more experience, we start realizing that we're not as good as we think. And then with more and more experience, we start getting a little bit more confidence. And I see a lot of people who have taken one or two statistical courses really rush to this peak very often. I mean, I myself, I've, I've had many papers, and I'll admit, published with statistics that aren't correct because I was forced to do things by reviewers. And I really want people to realize if you don't know something, call a statistician. There are tons of statisticians who are really out there, happy to help. So this is a very busy overview slide, but what we'll try to do is cover an introductory statistical course in about one hour. So I'll start off talking about types of data. We'll talk about nominal, ordinal, discrete data. We we'll talk about measures of central tendency, measures of dispersion, probability, a few probability distributions, some sampling distributions, hypothesis testing, uh, types of error, power, sample size calculation, comparison of two means, ANOVAs, a few non-parametric tests, and correlations. I've decided that contingency tables will probably fit best in the part two of the series, which discuss bridging classical statistics and artificial intelligence, because artificial intelligence sort of 
came out of, I would say, electrical engineering, but to some extent also statistics. And then for part two, I will review a bunch of papers, about 50 papers, and demonstrate common errors, published papers in AI machine learning. Those errors, I don't have any biases against any of the authors. It's just showing, hey, here's an error, and this is something we could learn from. So let's go on to the first type of data. So we'll talk about types of data. So the first type of data to understand is nominal data. So these are usually names of a variable. The names don't have any real value. So for example, here are some zip codes, 90210, 30314, 02115, 94305, 94143. These, these have no meanings, but these are zip codes that I've lived in in the United States. Yeah. Then you have things like political preferences, Republican, Democrat, Independent. That's completely nominal data, literary genres, comedies, dramas, satire, epics, tragedy, completely fine. Now, a similar type of data, but with rank, is called ordinal data. So ordinal data has a natural order. So, for example, school grades, you can have an A, B, C, D, where an A is better than a B. B is better than a C, C is better than an A, D. Faculty ranks are also naturally ordered uh, ordinal data. Instructor is a lower rank than assistant professor, lower rank than associate professor, professor. Education level is another example. Well, the reason I'm going through types of data is because types of data influence what type of statistics and what distributions you will assume. So the other type of data I want to talk to you about is interval data. So interval data sort of classifies and ranks data, but here zero actually represents an actual measurement. So for example, you can have zero degrees Celsius, which is an actual measurement, zero degrees Fahrenheit, an actual measurement. These are actually real numbers. However, in ratio data, uh, zero is not a real measurable quantity. So zero is uh, it's a true zero. So for example, height of zero or weight of zero. That means there's, there's no height or weight. Then we'll talk about discrete data versus continuous data. So discrete data are sort of whole numbers. These are finite values that, that can be counted. So for example, the number of ticket sales to a new movie that has come out, that, that's a discrete uh, number of, of, of events. So discrete data. Whereas continuous data is any data that can be measured sort of on an infinite scale. So for example, height. Height is something that you could be 68.7523177 centimeters. You can keep going on and on and on for height. So height can take any value between any two numbers, no matter how small those two numbers are. Of course, in, in math, we have this whole argument about can you measure something? And really in measuring something, you're sort of limited by the instrument that you're using to measure. Now, whenever someone collects data, one of the most important things to do is figure out, is this data real? Is this data sort of represent what I think? And to describe data, we like to do measures of central tendency. And these measures sort of give the, the reader or the, uh, the, the an analyst some idea as to where the data points sort of cluster around. So the most common measure of central tendency, one will see something called the mean or sometimes the average. And the mean, uh, if you're talking about a sample, it's denoted as X bar. If you're talking about a population mean, it's referred to as a Greek letter mu. Uh, so the mean X bar is calculated as 1 over N times the sum from I equals 1 to N of each measurement XI. So that's the average. So for example, let's consider this data set. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 numbers. And if we were to calculate the mean, we'll add up these numbers we get 55 and we divide by 10, we get 5.5. So that's the mean. However, if you have a very good uh, research student, say a research student from uh, from Egypt, you can be very, very con convinced that you have uh, really good data. But if you have a, a student who enters the wrong number by accident, so say for example, you have uh, data two, which instead of entering 10, they've entered 100, you can see that your mean has changed significantly. So just adding a single data point really changes your mean. So because of this, we think the mean is extremely sensitive to outliers. So a lot of people don't like using the mean because of that. Single data points can really tweak your results. 
One other measure of central tendency is the median. Now this is far more robust to outliers. So the, to calculate the median, what you do is you order the data from smallest to largest or largest to smallest, and you find the midpoint. It depends on if you have an even number of observations or odd number of observations, but essentially you can calculate the median finding the value of the n plus one divided by two rank or the average of the n divided by two rank plus the n divided by two plus one rank. So for example, here, if you have this data, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, you find that the midpoint is somewhere between five and six. So your median is 5.5, it's the average of five and six. If you have the same typographical error or data entry error, data two, you find that the median is completely unchanged, 5.5. So it's extremely robust to outliers. Now, the mode is something that we also look at, but less rarely do we report this in, in clinical practice. The mode is the most frequently observed value for any variable. It's extremely robust to outliers as well. So with modes, you can have the most frequent number. You can have a unimodal distribution, bimodal distribution, multimodal distributions. So those are the measures of central tendency. So next I'll talk about the measures of dispersion. So the range is essentially the, the smallest to largest variable in value. So for example, in that data set that we showed before, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, the range would be one to 10. And if we have the outlier, the data, which is sort of contaminated by uh, data entry error, you can see that the range goes from one to 100. So the range is actually very sensitive to outliers. So you'll find that most people will not report range in, in papers, although some papers will ask for it. The interquartile range is a little bit more robust. And what this is, this is the range between the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile in value. So here with this data, you can see that the interquartile range is 2.5, that's a 25th percentile, that's halfway between two and three. And the 75th percentile is halfway between seven and eight, 7.5. If there is an outlier, what we have is no change. The interquartile range stays relatively, well, it stays unchanged. So it's very robust to having outliers, either large outliers or very small outliers. So some people will, if you have a very skewed distribution, report a median with the interquartile range. I think most journals prefer to have mean plus the standard deviation. Uh, let's talk about the variance in standard deviation. So the variance, if you're talking about a population, it's sigma squared. If you're talking about from a sample from a population, it's S squared. So sigma squared is equal to one over N times the sum of the XIs minus mu. This is if mu is known, so you can have sigma squared. Uh, if mu is unknown, and it's from a sample, we use X bar as, as a proxy for mu. So we lose, uh, so we use N minus one as a denominator here rather than N. So S squared is equal to one over N minus one times the sum from one equals N to XI minus X bar all squared. And the standard deviation is just the square root of the variance. Because we're looking at these differences from the mean and the mean is affected by outliers, it's also sensitive to outliers. Final measure of dispersion is the coefficient of variation. Sometimes you'll see this considered in, in a lot of economics journals, they like to talk about this, the relative standard deviation. And what they do is just divide the standard deviation by the mean. And that sort of gives them an idea of you know the coefficient of variation. This is also because it depends on two things that are sensitive to outliers, it's also sensitive to outliers. So we're going to switch Ronnie, gears a little. Yes. I had a question about um, significant digits. You kind of alluded to, depending on the field, uh, folks may get a particular but significant digits for measurement. Um, the one case that I'm curious about in particular is when your outcome or when you're reporting a mean, like in a paper, where or if your outcome is a mean, where wouldn't your your significant digits kind of follow central li limit theorem kind of depending on your sample size. So if you have more measurements, you can get more precise than maybe the centimeters you have on your ruler or whatnot. 
And I'm just curious on what your statistical perspective is on that for reporting. Oh, wow. That's a, that's a very interesting question. So let me see if I understand your question. You're saying that, uh, say we measure people's heights and we're getting numbers between 68 and 75, let's say, I don't know, 75 inches, because uh, we're using an, an inch ruler per se. Yep. But when we get the mean of those heights, you may end up with like 70 inches. But the mean yes. will be something 70.1467. Yes. And it's the point 1467 you're concerned about. You're guessing that from central limit theorem, we should be able to go further than the actual limits of resolution of the ruler rather than... Uh, Exa exactly. We're, when we're reporting the mean, we know the mean to the standard error based on our sample size. So the square, square root of n divided square, uh, standard error is divided by square root of n for our standard deviation. And so if we have a thousand people, we can report that mean more accurately than we have if we have five people. That, that is the same true. thing with in imaging, for example, we make report like a mean outcome for, like so for cartilage, we do cartilage uh, no, no, often in my work. I, I see what you're yeah. saying. I think that's true. Um, I'm just trying to wonder what if happens if you have some sort of ruler that's biased or some sort of measurement that's not true or is it not uniformly biased? Is that going to hold up all the time? I think I think for uh, for practical purposes, yes, that's correct. I think most journals will, will will do that. You can you can get a much tighter estimate of your mean from a larger sample size. Is what you're saying? So I agree yeah. with you. Cool. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we're going to move on. Thank you so much for that great question. So probability. So probability is a very interesting um, topic. It's, it's not natural at all. Let me see how many. Ah. So we have 19 participants on this this uh, chat. I'm about 50% likely to, for this to work. We have about a one in two chance of two people on this chat sharing the same birth date. Hmm. If, if you had a larger sample size, I'd, I'd do it definitively. But you only need about 40 people in a call to guarantee that two people share the same birth date, which is something that's not naturally intuitive. Uh, so let's talk about probability here. So in terms of this, I'm doing a two by two contingency table. And what we have is the gold standard, which is, I'm going to say disease and no disease. And then we have our test statistic or our, uh, metric that we're using. So you can test positive with using your, your AI algorithm or test negative using your algorithm. So for sensitivity, we define that as a probability one test positive given disease. Uh, so in this situation, the probability of having disease is A plus C. Probability that you have, uh, you test positive, that's A divided by A plus C. So your sensitivity is A divided by A plus C. So sensitivity is also called recall. And you'll see this very commonly if you go to the IEEE journals, they talk about recall quite a lot. We call it sensitivity. And I have this little mnemonic here, right? It's a mnemonic, something that sort of helps you remember which is which. If you're sensible, you have great recall. You could use it if you like. And sensitivity sort of ranges between 0 and 1, or 0% to 100%. The specificity is slightly different. Uh, so this is the probability that one tests negative given there is no disease. This is disease complement. So the probability of having no disease is B plus D. Probability that you test negative is D divided by B plus D. So again, specificity ranges from 0 to 1, or some people report in percentages 0 to 100%. Now, the accuracy is what you want to have is all of your points on the diagonal. You want to have everyone who tests positive to have the disease and everyone who tests negative to have no disease. So C would represent people who have the disease but test negative. So those will be false negatives. And B would represent people who have no disease but test positive. So B would be all false positives. So your accuracy is really A plus D divided by the total number of uh, individuals or test uh, subjects that you have. So accuracy can range between zero to 100%. Positive predictive value. This is uh, the probability that someone has a disease given they test positive. So the probability that you test positive is A plus, well, it's A plus B, which is people who test positive A plus B. And the probability that you have the disease is A, divided by A plus B. So this is also known as the precision. So P for positive predictive value, 
and the P for precision. So that's how you remember words. So when they say precision, positive predictive value, when someone says recall, well, if you have good recall, you must be pretty sensible, sensitivity. Uh, negative predictive value uh, is the probability that you don't have the disease given you test negative. So the probability that you test, you're testing negative, well, the number of people who test negative is C plus T. And the probability would be D divided by C plus T. So this is your negative predictive value. Again, both range from 0 to 1 or 0% to 100%. Now, a lot of people talk about prevalence, and the prevalence is just simply the probability of having the disease. And here would be A plus C divided by A plus B plus C plus T. So this column divided by, or this cell divided by this cell. Now, it's very important that a lot of the studies we do are retrospective in nature and they're sort of case control studies. So, so the, the prevalence is artificially inflated. So this is not a true prevalence per se. Um, that's why I have this little asterisk here. Now, in also in the IEEE journals and also in our journal, you'll see people talk about the F1 score. So the F1 score is the harmonic mean of precision and recall. So the harmonic mean of the positive predictive value and the sensitivity. So that's equal to twice the recall times the precision divided by recall plus precision. And that ranges from zero to one. Uh, if you have an F1 score over 0.8, most people are pretty happy around that, that number. Now in the diagnostic testing world, we like talking about positive likelihood ratios because people will always say, okay, you have an AUC of 0.8, so what? And so the positive likelihood ratio really helps guide what you should do and if this is a good test or not. So this is the sensitivity divided by one minus specificity. This ranges from zero to infinity. So if you have a positive likelihood ratio greater than 10, this is a great test. It's a large increase in the likelihood of disease. If you have a likelihood ratio of one, no real change in the likelihood of disease, this is not a very good test. Now the converse is also in true, the negative likelihood ratio. So the negative likelihood ratio is one minus sensitivity divided by specificity. And this negative likelihood ratio, less than negative, less than 0 0.1, sorry, is a large decrease in the likelihood of disease. If you have a likelihood ratio, a negative likelihood ratio of one, no change in the likelihood of disease. So this negative likelihood ratio would range between uh, zero and one. Uh, you can see in both cases, the sensitivity shows up in the, the numerator. So it's sensitivity divided by one minus specificity for positive, and for negative, it's one minus sensitivity divided by specificity. So I think that's pretty easy to remember. So let's talk about this ROC curves, the receiver operator characteristic curves. So these are curves that sort of actually came out of World War II. And uh, these are from the electrical engineers trying to figure out what exactly was going on during World War II to sort of help finish the war as soon as possible. So they started using these plots of sensitivity or the true positive rate versus specificity or the false positive rate. So ideally, what you want to have is the top left corner. So if you have a test here that's exactly the top left corner, this is perfect. You have perfect true positive rate with zero false positive rates. But all of us know that in science, we get things that don't look like this. Actually, I, I had a model that one of my postdocs showed me today and uh, we had an AUC of 0.497, <laughs> which is actually a little bit worse than uh, random. And, and that happens during research. Um, so what we want is a, a, the curve to be mostly in the uh, upper left region. And we have lots of software that actually finds the optimal threshold that maximizes the area under this ROC curve. And some people call it the AUC, some people call it the AUROC, sort of the same thing. So next we're gonna switch gears and talk about theoretical population probability distributions. We'll talk about uh, discrete distributions as well as uh, continuous distributions before we, we go on. If you have any questions, please stop me. So first I'll start with the binomial distribution. This is a very common distribution. Um, this is a binomial distribution is actually a sum of N independent Bernoulli trials. So Bernoulli trial, the most common Bernoulli trial we know about is the coin toss. 
uh, if someone tosses a coin and asks you, what's the probability of heads? If the coin is already tossed, the probability of heads is either one or zero because it's either heads or not heads. Uh, but if you do a lot of uh, trials where you flip this coin, you can figure out what the actual probability of heads or tails would be. So the binomial mean is n, which is the number of uh, trials times p, the probability of success, let's say heads. The variance is known quantity n times p times one minus p. And the probability density function PDF, so you can figure out the probability you have any number. So the probability you have 10 heads. If you have 20 tosses, you can figure that out. That'll be 20 choose 10 times p to the power 10 times 1 minus p to the power 20 minus 10, which is 10. So you can actually figure out the probability of any event from a binomial. And you can also figure out the probability of a cumulative distribution by just figuring out what the other numbers could be. So if it's like 10 or fewer, you can go 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. So this is a very nice distribution. And what we notice with the binomial distribution is that n and p get large. It starts looking more and more normally distributed. So some people think if you have n p greater than 5 and n p times 1 minus p greater than 5, then this thing is very close to a normal distribution. But of course, it cannot be truly normal because this is a discrete distribution and normal distribution is a very continuous distribution. The next distribution I'll talk about is a very nice one. This is a Poisson distribution. This came out of uh, France. This is a discrete probability distribution and uh, it's used to express the probability of a number of events happening in a fixed interval of time. So this is, for example, the number of kidney biopsy complications one has per year is on average five with some variance five. And uh, you can start looking at your data to figure out is there an outlier year or what's going on. You can actually do something a little more fancy using like a Weibull distribution to figure out are we having uh, too many complications or too few complications. So what's cool about the Poisson distribution is the mean is lambda, variance is lambda, and the probability density function looks like this. The probability that x is equal to some number, so say five, is e to the minus lambda, lambda to the power of five divided by five factorial. So five factorial is five times four times three times two times one. Okay, so here we have a few Poisson distributions and we have lambda equals one, lambda equals four, lambda equals 10. And we can see how as lambda gets pretty large, things start looking more and more normally distributed. And then of course, here's one of my favorite distributions. This is a distribution because it's, uh, we know it's a normal distribution, but it's named after a gentleman called Carl Friedrich Gauss, who is one of, in, in my opinion, one of the smartest people who've ever lived. Uh, when he was eight years old, he he's very precocious. And of course, at that age, kids are very rambunctious and somewhat obnoxious. He was very uh, conceited too. So his, his school teacher, put him out of his classes one day and said, do not come back in here, young Carl, until you add up all the numbers from one to 100. And he went outside and within like two minutes, he came back inside and said, oh, 5,050. And this teacher was flabbergasted and spent the entire afternoon calculating, how did he figure this out? And he sat there and he showed her the proof to what we know as the sum of an arithmetic series. He said, you put the numbers one to 100 in a row, and then you write them 100 to one in another row. And so you have, if you add up those two rows, you'll have 101, 100 times, and then you just divide by two, and that's the, the, the answer. And it, it's a, just a brilliant proof for someone who's eight years old. So I, I, love, I love this guy. But anyway, he gave us uh, the normal distribution. So this is a distribution that has mean mu variance sigma squared. And uh, this is the PDF, it's one over the square root of two pi sigma e to the minus one over two sigma squared times x minus mu all squared. And the mean, ha the, the normal distribution has some very interesting uh, properties. So we know that about 68% of the population lies within one standard deviation of the mean, about 95% lies within two standard deviations of the mean, and about 99.7% lies within approximately three standard deviations of the mean. So let's talk about the central limit theorem. 
this is one of the foundations of statistics. And the central limit theorem says pretty much, if you take the mean value of a sample of any size n, then the means of these uh, samples, if you get the means of means, uh, the distribution of means is normally distributed regardless of the underlying distribution the samples are drawn from. So if you draw the means from this irregular distribution, you can see that the sampling distribution of these means turns out to be a normal distribution. It's just absolutely phenomenal. So this is why the normal distribution really comes into statistics quite often. Now let's talk about confidence intervals. So we're gonna put the information from the prior two slides to determine confidence intervals. Now, if we want a 98%, sorry, 68% confidence interval, we can use X bar minus, this is the standard deviation divided by the square root of N. That's one standard deviation, X bar plus one standard deviation divided by the square root of N. So that's pretty much saying that 68% of the, the points will lie within one standard deviation of the mean. For the 95% confidence interval, you can say X bar minus two sigma divided by root N. So that's two standard deviations, X bar plus two sigma divided by root N. So 95% of the, the points probability mass would lie between two standard deviations above the mean and two standard deviations below the mean. Now, what's a very key thing to learn about confidence intervals is that this is a frequentist interpretation. So what that means is if you see a paper and it says the 95% confidence interval is 9.5 to 10.5, well, that either has the true mean in it or it doesn't. So the probability of having the true mean is either zero or one. But what we really mean as statisticians is if you repeat that experiment 100 times the exact same way, the 95% confidence intervals generated this way will cover the true mean 95% of the time. So a single realization, a single experiment will either cover the true mean or not. Now here's the little bit of a feedback session here. We're gonna do the scientific method. So for the scientific method, we must understand that proofs are really only possible in mathematics. So in the biomedical sciences, what we have done is we sort of make a, a conjecture or a hypothesis, null hypothesis. And the basis is that we want to reject that null hypothesis. So in science, we really need to understand the knowledge of logic rules. So, so let me give you some examples here of logic. Uh, so for example, if it's rained, this is a truth statement, and then here's a claim to follow. So the truth statement is that if it rained, then the ground is wet. So I'm going to claim the ground is wet, therefore it rained. Is that a true statement or not a true statement? Does anyone know? True or false? You should you, you should know, but I don't know. Anyone wants to say anything? False. It is false. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. It's false. Why is that? Oh, I forget the exact the the formal term for it, but but it, but the fact that the ground it it's uh, post hoc ergo propter hoc. It's it's, uh, it's <laughs> well said. Yeah, it it's the the uh, the consequent this, is this is the fallacy of asserting. Yeah, it, it's an assertion, but it doesn't it doesn't uh, cover every possible condition in which uh, exactly in exactly which the, the posterior is 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 true. So this is the fallacy of asserting the consequence. This is perfect. And what about the second one? It did not rain, so the ground is not wet. True or false? It's false. It's actually just the uh, the converse of, of the first statement. So this is the fallacy of denying the antecedent. Chuck, you're on fire here. Excellent. So these are the logic games that you, you have to go through before we start learning statistics so that we understand. I, I had Aristotle was my logic teacher. Oh, really? Yeah, I've been around at this a while. Chuck, have you heard of uh, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates? Yeah, I, said, I, I was in Aristotle's class. Oh, I see. No, yeah. I was going to say uh, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates. Of, uh, exactly. Brown. Morons, morons. Exactly. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, we have a good sense of humor here. Excellent. <laughs> so let's go into hypothesis testing. So you can have one-sided or two-sided null hypotheses. So one-sided hypothesis would look like something like this. Men weigh less than women on average. So the null hypothesis is that the mean weight of men is less than the mean weight of women. And you can have uh, the one-sided alternative here would look sort of different. It'll be on average, men weigh more than or equal to women. So it's the mean of men is greater than or equal to mean of women. So this must satisfy. So, so any two numbers must be either equal to greater than or less than each other, right? The two-sided null hypothesis is slightly different. So we use the equal statement here. So we'll say men and women weigh the same amount on average. So that's null hypothesis. And the two-sided alternative would be on average, men's weights are not equal to women's weights. So the mean for men is not equal to the mean for women, or you could write it like the mean for men minus the mean for women is equal to some value delta. So let's talk about errors because these are very important. These errors actually came out of drum roll, uh, the legal system. I think there was a lawyer who said he'd rather 10 guilty men go free than one innocent man be harmed. So this is where the whole idea of type one errors came out. So type one error is the probability that one rejects the null hypothesis when in fact the null hypothesis is correct. So this is what we call a rejection error. We say alpha here. Generally, it's fixed a priori, and most scientists choose 0 0.05, but you'll see different thresholds. You'll see 0 0.1 for small sample sizes. Sometimes you'll see 0 0.01 for other sample sizes. Now, the type 2 error is a probability that one fails to reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is indeed incorrect. Some people call it an acceptance error, but it's not really acceptance. It's sort of a fail to reject, but I guess they're going to be equivalent actions. So the type 2 error is also called beta and your power is one minus beta. Most scientists choose a power of 80%, but some people will go higher depending on the stakes, 90%. But what you can see here is that there's a lopsided uh, thing here where these numbers aren't equivalent. This is 20%, beta is 20%, whereas alpha is 0.05. And there's another error that we don't talk about, and this is called the type three error. This is where you correctly reject the null hypothesis, but for the wrong reason. Um, so you, you probably never see this unless you do a statistics course. <clears throat> so let's talk about power. So I think this is one of the most important things in science. Power is the probability that the null hypothesis is rejected if it's false. Now I've seen multiple studies where uh, they're claiming drug A is equivalent to drug B, and they have a very small sample size. And you know that there's just not enough power to say that they're equivalent. That there's no chance you're going to reject the null hypothesis because it's, it's too underpowered. And this sometimes leads to really, really bad science because the conclusions made are incorrect. So what we do is under the null hypothesis, this first, the leftmost curve is the null hypothesis. We figure out what are our thresholds to reject. So we reject if you hit the alpha over two threshold on this side or the alpha over two threshold on this side. So this is the rejection zone where we reject. And then we consider the same null distrib same the distribution under the alternative where mu naught minus mu one is equal to delta. And we consider this original threshold where we would reject the null. What if this is correct? What is this probability here? And this is beta. And we fix these numbers to calculate our sample size. This is how we get our power statement. And this is how we get our sample size calculations. So when we do sample size calculations, it's pretty much a function of your type 1 error. Usually it's two-sided, so it's alpha over 2. If it's one-sided, it's just alpha, plus beta, which is your type 2 error, times sigma divided by whatever difference you think you're going to see squared. So you can see that if you use a larger type 1 error, so bigger alpha, um, you're actually um, going to change the sample size. Same thing for beta. And if your delta is smaller, you need a bigger sample size. So the smaller the delta, the bigger delta, the sample size that you need. And then we also do other things too, where we figure out if we need dropouts, you can actually, if you, your sample size you truly need is, is 44, fine. But if you have 20% of dropouts, you just divide 44 by one minus dropouts and you can get uh, the true sample size that you'll need. 
if you have a very large sigma, like the standard deviation is large, you can see that this actually causes uh, the sample size to be larger. So you really want something with a very tight distribution. So let's talk about dependent versus independent samples. And this has very, very uh, tremendous implications for machine learning because we use a lot of these uh, paired type test systems in, in machine learning. So for example, uh, this is a dependent test. Let's talk about dependent tests. If a doctor wants to know if a new drug reduces blood pressure, the study design doctor measures the blood pressure of 20 patients before and after using the drug for one week. Because it's the same patient that we're measuring, each patient is going to be con correlated with his or herself. And so you actually end up having a, a paired set of measurements. So what we're looking at here is a difference in the post versus pre measurements. So this is a paired analysis. Uh, sometimes this is another example. The doctor wants to know if a DEXA device is working well. So what they do is they repeat the measurements on 30 consecutive patients immediately after each other. So these are duplicate measurements. Uh, in AI, we actually do this. We have like the same test data set, but we're going to apply maybe a random forest classifier, maybe some sort of gradient boosted machine, neural network, just to see how each test performs. But it's the same data set. So these are paired type of data. <clears throat> we also have naturally paired data. So, for example, doctor wants to evaluate if a new drug affects eye redness, administers the drug to the right eye of 20 patients, placebo to the left eye. So you have two data sets in which the left eye can be paired with the right eye. So the left eye is sort of the control for the right eye. So these are naturally paired environments. So in MSK radiologists, we see this with knee analyses, we see it with eye analyses. And what's really dangerous is sometimes some people will actually analyze the right knee and consider the left knee as completely independent, and, and that's not exactly correct. So here's an example of what it looks like. So you'll have like, uh, this is a subject, 10 subjects. Here's your pre-score, here's your post-score, here's your difference. And what happens is this will actually follow a T statistic and the average distance, D, D is the average difference of all these paired me measurements. And S is the standard deviation of D, and n is the total number, in this case, 10 subjects. So we have to thank the Guinness company for this T statistic because this actually came out of a uh, Guinness brewery. So this is the student's T statistic. And uh, this statistician worked there as a master brewer, but you couldn't publish anything because it was all Guinness's uh, intellectual property. So they just published this thing under the, uh, the moniker, the pseudonym of uh, student, student's T statistic. So here you can compare two means now, but this time we're looking at independent samples with known standard deviations. So you can have the mean, and my wife saw this this slide and she said, too many equations, Ronnie, too many equations. <laughs> so you can compare the mean, mu one equals mu two, and here's the alternative, so this is a two-sided test. And here's your Z statistic. This is assuming that you know the standard deviation. So your confidence interval will be X bar, X one minus X two, plus minus the appropriate Z threshold, and here's the standard deviation. Now, sometimes you don't know the standard deviations, and if you don't know the standard deviations, then we have to estimate them using the uh, sample standard uh, deviation. And here, instead of using the Z statistic, we'll have to use a T statistic. Now, sometimes we assume that we don't know the standard deviations, but we also think that they're equal in both samples. So we assume that the standard deviations in under mu one and mu two are the same. So then we just use the pooled standard deviation pool variance. And this is the same T statistic. And here's the uh, N plus one, N one plus N two minus one degrees of freedom. So this is just the pooled estimate when you assume that the null and the alternative have the same uh, variance. Now we're almost finished, and we're going to just talk quickly, briefly about the analysis of variance. So I talked about comparing briefly two means where you can actually know the standard deviations or you don't know the standard deviations, but what if we have more than two groups? So what if you want to compare the mean income levels between zip codes 90210, 30314, 94305, and 94143? So we use a test called the analysis of variance. It's a very interesting test. 
So here's what it looks like. So what we do is we look at within the zip code, we calculate each person's income minus the mean for that zip code squared and average it over all zip codes. And then we look at the between. So for every zip code, what's the mean for that zip code minus the overall mean for the country? And you add that up and then you have the total. So what we have is the sum of the squares within compared to the sum of the squares between the numbers of degrees of freedom is k minus one. This will be n minus k. So this takes on a chi-square distribution because it's a usually a normal minus a normal. So that should be normal. And when you divide a chi-square distribution by degrees of freedom, you end up with, uh, with the ratio turns out to be an F distribution. So what we have is the mean sum of squares within the mean sum of squares between, and the ratio of this number is an F statistic with K minus one in the numerator, K minus one and N minus K degrees of freedom. This is the analysis of variance test. This is to compare multiple means between several groups. So we'll talk briefly about non-parametric tests. Uh, so when I talked about comparing the means, we are doing, uh, normal type tests, and this is a parametric test where we knew the sort of underlying distribution. We assumed that we knew the underlying distribution, but what if the data doesn't follow any known distribution? If you have a large enough sample size, you can get away using parametric tests. But if you have a small sample size, most people like to use these, what's called distribution-free or non-parametric tests. I'll just talk about three, but there are several non-parametric tests. So for Pierre dependent data, we use the sign test or the Wilcoxon signed rank test. And for independent data, we'll use something called the Wilcoxon rank sum test. People call it the Man Whitney U test. So here's a little example of sign tests. So for example, I'm just showing you again. We had pre and post, or group one and group two, sorry. We had 5.5, 5.0, 4.5, 4.5. And we just put the signs here of the differences. Negative, 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 po well, positive, negative, negative, negative. And then, so we assume that the null probability is 0.5. We use a binomial distribution. N equals 10, P equals 0.5. And we can calculate what the probability we see. This value, something as extreme or more extreme than what we've noticed. And this is, of course, statistically significant. This is highly unlikely that there isn't a difference between these two groups. So I won't show you the formulas for these uh, tests, but the Wilcoxon sign rank test you use for paired data. It's really good for continuous outcomes, non-normal data or skewed data, and it's just based on ranks. So they're all based on ranks, but you use the Wilcoxon sign rank for paired data, the Man Whitney or Wilcoxon rank sum for independent data. Okay, and then finally, we'll talk about correlations. So correlations are very interesting. So correlations are usually looking at linear associations between two variables. So you can actually have two variables that are associated, but not in a linear way. And the correlation may be zero, but there's still an association. So for most people, when they're doing parametric analysis of correlations, they use something called Carl Pearson's correlation coefficient. And if you're doing a non-parametric analysis, you use Spearman's rank correlation coefficient. So this is pretty much just saying, how close do these points cluster and do they cluster on a line? So you can see this is a strong positive correlation, which means that X predicts Y very strongly. Weak, you see X predicts Y, but there's a little bit of variation there and X and Y both increase simultaneously. Here's a strong negative correlation where as X increases, Y decreases. And here you can see that there's no correlation between X and Y. So as X increases, Y does its own thing. And as Y increases, X does its own thing. Now, correlation does not mean causation. This is a really important point. Uh, a lot of people see strong correlations and think, well, X must cause, uh, this correlation means that th this association is causal. That's not correct at all. And if you have no correlation, that does not mean you have no association. So here's a little cartoon to demonstrate this. You can have something following a sort of parabolic shape here. And uh, you can see that there's a very tight correlation between what's going on, well, association between what's going on here, but it's not a linear correlation. It's not a straight line correlation. Here you can see that there is a correlation as an association here. Uh, 
as you go to a higher X, so assuming X increases here, you can see that there's more variability here. This is an example of no association, that as uh, X increases, the variability of Y is pretty much the same. It's just all over the place. And here you can see this is a positive correlation here. So back in the 19, ooh, boy, 80s, I think probably before almost anyone here was born, uh, Bradford Hill put out something called the causal criteria. He's a statistician from England. And he said that you really want to have these nine things to really help you think that a correlation actually causes some, there's some sort of causation going on here. Now, we could talk about causal analysis and diacyclic graphs and stuff like that, but we're just going to talk about statistics from the 50s and 60s here. <laughs> so first thing he talked about was the strength. So if you have something that has a really large effect size, you know, like jumping out of a plane with a parachute, then you have, um, you survive that. that. That's something that's really, really large effect size because uh, most people who jump out of planes don't really survive. Uh, it talks about consistency, meaning that this the study is reproducible and you're seeing the same effect over and over. Something that's really highly specific, the more specific, it's more likely to be causal. Temporality is something that's very important. The cause must precede the effect. So if you have something, you know, um, the effect somewhat temporarily in front of the cause, then the cause is highly unlikely to have caused the effect, probably did not cause the effect. He also talked about the biological gradient and a dose response. So we thought, the smoking caused lung cancer. If you saw people who were smoking one pack a day versus people who were smoking 20 packs a day, the people who were smoking 20 packs per day should have a higher risk than the people who were smoking one pack per day. Talked about plausibility, especially if you know some sort of mechanism by which uh, cigarette smoking may be causing lung cancer. And then coherence. What, what this means is that you have the epidemiological study and you also have the lab studies and they must both be uh, congruent and coherent with each other. Of course, eight is actually, can you do an experiment where you actually just perturb one variable and show that that's actually causing the change that you see? And then nine is sort of weak where he says, uh, similarities between the observed associations and other associations should be noted. So that is uh, me just wrapping up here. Here's my key pearls here for you guys. Recognize when you need help, especially when you're reviewing a, a manuscript. Ask your friendly statistician for help. Statisticians are very nice people. They're habitually in the number two or number three position on a paper, so they're not very um, aggressive or paper position, and, and they're very happy to help. I've never met a statistician who's not happy to help. Always engage your statistician before starting the study when you're doing the study design. Uh, one of the things that really bothered me as a statistician is that I'd always get the data post the proceed, post the whole data collection, and then you'd have to try to make up for serious design issues. And you'd always run into problems where someone's like, just get me a nice p-value so I can publish this. You know, uh, there's a little saying that p less than 0 0.05 means publish. So um, <laughs> engage your statistician before starting a study. And then it's really important to do a power sample size calculation before you start your study. This way you're guaranteed to actually answer the question you want to set out. Some people do studies where the studies are just tremendously underpowered and they make the wrong conclusion. That actually derails the whole scientific community. And my last two pearls are have fun. Research is a very great experience. You meet really fantastic people. I've met lot, wonderful people in, in research. It's, it's a great thing. It, it can be tedious but it can be a lot of fun when you realize you're the first person to discover something and you have to write it up so the rest of the world can know about it. And research, every single paper makes a little difference. So you guys are the smartest and the best and the future of all of radiology. Uh, you guys will go out to make a difference. So don't lose sight of that and uh, do your best. And reach out to me with emails if you have any questions. I have a part two of this where I really go into more of things like uh, dice coefficient, Hofstorff different distances, uh, IOUs, and, and the statistics behind these things uh, in much more, more detail. But I will terminate the talk right here. And you can shoot me emails, of course, at any point in time. And I'm happy to talk and chat. Any questions?
Ronnie, oh. can I ask a question? This is Pedro. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. Sorry, uh, it's late, and if it's long, we can probably talk about this later on. But um, so one thing that I, I never really know is which statistical test can be used to compare um, AUC, the areas under the curve from the ROC curves. Right. I've seen papers sometimes mention the longs test mentioned the statistical test that was utilized and i also have seen people using the delong test correct but also um the third thing is that i've seen papers that use a bunch of different types of ais uh ai um, models mm -hmm. and then compare them and I, I i don't know if that's adequate or not or when they're not adequate when it's not adequate to use the delong in that situation i see so, so I think most of the cases we are running into is where someone has the same test data set and multiple different uh, AI algorithms that they've run on that data set, right? So because right. it's the same data set, most people would use the DeLong's test in that setting to compare those two uh, ROC curves. Okay. All right, cool. Well, Ronnie, thank awesome. you. Thank you so much. We're we're at our time here. Thank you so much for the terrific presentation. And I hope we can get you back uh, to uh, to give the second part of the talk. The second one is a little bit more technical, but um I think I think it's much more needed today for everyone to really who's doing a lot of AI research to sort of understand the nuances of what's happening and what are the null distributions under all of these things because we, we assume certain things that aren't necessarily always true yeah and and well, then of course my, my funniest thing is that I know that you know like if we measure heights and weights they sort of shake out as a normal distribution but do random things from a computer shake out as a normal distribution ah, who knows uh. There, there's some interesting questions to be explored. Excellent. <laughs> so Perfect. let's hey, see. Thank you. And uh, to everyone, our, so our, our, our next session, will be uh, talking a little bit about writing skills. And actually, Ronnie, you've got me motivated. I think I'm going to have to give a talk on probability and Bayes nets. So, oh, okay, good, good. Excellent. All right. Thank you again. And uh, really appreciate the, uh, the presentation. Thank you so much for having me. This is All wonderful, right. fun, and uh, excellent. And Gianmarco, I'm going to respond to you offline. All right. Thank you so much. No Thanks, problem. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Take Bye. care.